Uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Fabrizio Sebastiani from CNR in Italy that he is going to talk about a very interesting topic, no, uh, namely the prediction of classifier accuracy in the wild. So I welcome you, Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you all for uh, for attending this talk. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, or, or let's say good evening or good morning, depending on what area of the world you are in. Uh, so let me introduce this talk. Okay, so um, as the title says, I will talk about uh, a task uh, predicting the accuracy that our classifier is going to have, a task that is go probably going to be interesting for many of us. And uh, what does in the wild mean? It means predicting the accuracy that our classifier is going to have on, let's say, data in the real world. Okay, data that might be distributionally different from the data that we have in our lab and that we have uh, tested our uh, system on. Okay, so let me. Uh, okay. Uh, let me introduce classifier accuracy prediction. Essentially, this is a task that we normally perform via k-fold cross-validation. No. Uh, the problem with uh, k-fold cross-validation is that uh, it returns uh, reliable results only when the training data and the data, the test data, the data we have tested our system on, uh, when these data are IID, identically and independently distributed. Okay? But it's still an open problem when T and U are not IID, a situation which is uh, often described as saying that the unlabeled data are out of distribution, or described as saying that there is data set shift between the distributions from which T and U have been uh, sampled, sampled out. Um, so this is essentially classifier accuracy prediction is one of several tasks that uh, uh, have to do with data set shift. Among these tasks, uh, there are, say, estimating the type of data set shift which is present in our data, or estimating the amount of data set shift, or also adapting uh, our own classifier to shift the data, adapting to uh, data that are out of distribution, which is what we often call um, domain adaptation. Uh, indeed, you know, predicting classifier accuracy in the wild is useful, you know, because it gives an answer to an often uh, stated question. How is my old classifier going to perform on these new data? Old classifier mean, might mean a classifier, you know, for which I don't have the original training data available anymore, or a classifier which I recognize is you know, was trained on data which are pretty different from the one from the ones that I'm going to tackle. So the question is, is my old classifier good enough? Is it going to be good enough on these new data? Or should I obtain new labels from these new data for retraining the classifier? So of course, I mean, this is very important to be able to assess this classifier accuracy on these new data especially important for also for responsible use of AI, you know, because sometimes what we don't want is to deploy our classifier maybe on a high stakes domain, you know, where the classifier is not going to perform as well as we had hoped it to be, you know. So this talk will be in general about predicting classifier accuracy in the wild. And it will also introduce a method that we have recently developed for doing classifier accuracy prediction under data set shift, a method that we have called uh, QUAC. Um, so let me introduce uh, data set shift in some detail. Essentially, the notion of data set shift starts from regarding the joint distribution, the joint distribution of our data, which is often you know, uh, indicated as PXY where X are, X are the covariates and Y are our labels. And data set shift is the situation in which we have two distributions, P1, XY, which is the source distribution, P2, XY, which is the target distribution. So a source distribution from which the training data come and target distribution from which the unlabeled data 
uh, come. So that is a shift is the situation in which P1 and P2 are different. While the usual situation that we often deal with, deal with in our research is the one in which P1 and P2 are the same. So the situation in which the data are independently uh, identically distributed. You know? um, so what are the causes of that such shift? There may be multiple causes, but there are, let's say we can group them in two different causes, depending on whether the shift is in the data that model uh, a certain reality or whether a shift is in the reality. You know? So real shift is a, a situation in which there are variations in the environment that the data represents. So the environment that the data represents is not stable, is not stationary. And so the conditions uh, under which we are going to deploy our data are not the same as the conditions under which the uh, classifier was tested. A ex typical example, say, let's think of uh, September 11. You know? Well, before September 11, if you were looking at newspapers, the prevalence, the, the proportion of terrorism-related news was very small it suddenly becomes very high after September 11. So this is a change in the environment that the data represents, real shift. A different type of shift is virtual shift. So virtual shift has to do with the misrepresentation on the environment on the part of our data. So our data don't represent the environment correctly. Our training data don't represent correctly the environment which the classifier is going to tackle once deployed. And the reason is that there may be several causes why um, we may have introduced in the training data some uh, select sample selection bias. So, so a bias that we may have introduced intentionally, say, you know, when oversampling the minority class. Okay. So suppose we have to, 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 to train a classifier for recognizing a rare illness, a one in a million illness. Okay, so certainly we have to oversample the minority class in order to build reasonable classifiers. But the sample selection bias may, hold, may have also been introduced unintentionally, say, if we have used active learning in, in order to train our classifier. Because active learning builds a training set, which is anything but a random sample of our um, of our distribution. Okay, so active learning inherently builds training sets which are biased. Okay, so um, let's see how we can tackle data set shift. Uh, the best way to tackle data set shift is via factorization, by um, decomposing the prior, let's say, the, the joint distribution of the covariates and the labels. Okay, so one typical way in which we can do this factorization is, is to factorize, to decompose PXY as PY given X times PX. This is a factorization useful in so-called X implies Y problems, okay? because it um, basically makes it explicit the dependence of Y on X. So these are uh, problems which have been referred to as causal learning, problems in which we want to infer the presence of a certain phenomenon, Y, from its causes, X. Um, a different factorization is to factorize, to decompose PXY as PX given Y times PY. And this is useful in so-called Y implies X problems, because it makes it clear it makes the dependence, it makes explicit the dependence of the covariates X on the label Y. So this is, these are problems which are called anti-causal learning, problems in which we want to infer the presence of a certain phenomena from, not from causes X, but from symptoms X. So depending on whether we are in the presence of causal learning or anti-causal learning, uh, the literature has identified three major types of data shift. So one is called covariate shift, which typically affects X implies Y problems. The other is prior probability shift, which typically affects Y implies X problems. 
And the third one is concept shift, which affects may affect both types of problems. And I will look at them in detail one by one. So covariate shift. As we said, it affects uh, X implies Y problems. It affects causal learning, in which we infer the presence of a phenomenon X, a phenomenon Y from causes X. So one typical case is weather forecasting or avalanche forecasting. So in avalanche forecasting, we want to foresee whether a certain avalanche will fall based on some physical potential causes, such as humidity, presence of wind, presence of high snowpack, etc. You know, in these cases, you know, if we want to learn an avalanche forecasting system, we may incur in covariate shift. Covariate shift is defined as a situation in which the causal dependence between X and Y doesn't change. So P1 of Y given X is the same as P2 Y given X. But the marginal distribution of the covariates changes. So P1 of X is different from P2 of X. So a typical case, suppose I want to do avalanche forecasting. I train my system on uh, data from, uh, say, northern Italy, you know, from the Alps. And I want to deploy my system on uh, Scandinavia, you know. Well, here are the, the physical laws that uh, uh, to which uh, avalanches obey are the same in Scandinavia and the Alps. But the typical conditions that are found in the Alps and in Scandinavia are different. Okay, so this is an example of covariate shift. So prior probability shift is a different one. So the context is Y implies X problems, anti-causal learning. So that is inferring the presence of a phenomenon Y from symptoms, not from causes, you know. In this case, well, you know, examples of these are maybe handwritten digit recognition, authorship attribution, or predicting illnesses from symptoms, okay? So take handwritten digit recognition. So essentially here, you know, we have a situation in which a person draws, say, a zero, you know, draws a zero and uses some graphical tracts, you know, to to generate this zero. So, you know, the class zero implies the covariates, the graphical tracts. You know? So here we might have prior probability shift, we might incur in prior probability shift, type of shift, which is also called label shift, which is defined as, as a situation in which the causal relationship between the covariates and the labels stays the same, is invariant across uh, training data and the label data, but the marginal distribu distribution of the labels change. Okay, so an example might be digit recognition for binary digits only. We have trained the system to do handwritten digit recognition. We have trained it, you know, to um, to recognize uh, decimal digits from zero to one, and now we we want to deploy it deploy it on a situation in which we have to recognize zeros or ones only. Okay, so here the prevalence, the, the proportion of the classes has changed, but the way of drawing zeros and ones has not changed. So concept shift is the third type. Okay, so it may affect either X implies Y problems or Y implies X problems. So it's actually defined as a situation in which uh, the causal relationship between covariates and labels changes. Okay, so it might be the case that P uh, Y given X change or P X given Y changes. Okay, so one example of concept shift is say in product reviews, product reviews may be, you know, marked from one star to five stars. So our perception of what counts as a positive review may change. So maybe in previous data, previously we had an attitude towards considering positive anything that was marked from three stars uh, onwards. But then our perception might change and we want to, we decide that we want to consider positive only what is marked from four stars upwards, okay? So this is concept shift. So the very concept of what counts as positive has changed. So <clears throat> let's go back to classifier actually, accuracy prediction. So recently in the literature, there have been a number of 
classifier actually classifier accuracy prediction methods which have emerged in the, in the literature in the last five years. One of the problems is that the state of the art in this task is still somehow unsatisfactory for three reasons. Okay? So first of all, the error that these uh, methods do, you know, is still sometimes too high for these methods to be applicable in uh, practice. And the second reason is that the experimentation which has been carried out in, in the papers that have presented these methods sometimes is not really thorough enough. And the third reason is that uh, most of the methods that have been presented deal with uh, only one classifier accuracy measure, which is typically vanilla accuracy. So we actually sat down to, to do some research in order to try and solve, try and improve on all these three problems. You know, and the method that we are going to present, which is called Quack, you know, has two interesting characteristics. First of all, it's independent of the learning algorithm used for training the classifier. So it works for SVMs, it works for deep learning, it works for logistic regression. And the second is that it is independent of the classifier accuracy measure chosen. So at least in theory, it works for, you know, vanilla accuracy, F1, you know, balanced accuracy and, and the rest. Okay. Quack is called quantification. It comes from quantification for accuracy prediction. And the reason why I'm speaking of quantification will be apparent in the next slides. You know? So uh, speaking of Quack, uh, it gives me, gives me the opportunity to describe what is the standard experimental setting for um, classifier accuracy prediction. Typically, we assume a domain X of items, a set of Y of classes, a training set, which is assumed unavailable. So we assume that we don't have a training data anymore, which may be a realistic assumption. Uh, we still assume instead that we have uh, a validation set available. So we have other data coming from the same distribution from which the training data had been sampled. And we have unlabeled data unlabeled data available from a different distribution, P1 different from P2. And it is indeed the accuracy of our classifier trained on T, you know, the accuracy on U that we are going to, that we want to estimate. Estimate according to an accuracy measure A. Okay. So this setting is essentially equivalent to a setting in which uh, no validation set uh, V is available, but the original training set T is still available. So all the solutions that work for one setting work for the other setting too. So um, where does our method uh, start from? It starts from the observation, from, from the observation that any classifier accuracy measure can be computed from a contingency table. The contingency table obtained by applying our classifier H to the unlabeled data. So essentially, if we want to estimate the accuracy of our classifier, we only need to estimate the values, the counts of each cell in the contingency table. It's easier said than done, but we'll give it a try. Um, so the idea that derives from this observation is the following. We want to view the cells of the contingency table as classes. Classes, you know, that may be, you know, the object of classification, okay? So once we see them as classes, what we can do is to train on our labeled validation data, a model that estimates the values of these contingency cells, estimates how many of our unlabeled items have ended up in these contingency table cells, which means how many of our unlabeled data belong to these classes. So belonging to a class is a familiar notion. You know, it falls under the domain of classification. So we can foresee that we might want to train a classifier in order to estimate these values. And of course, once we have these estimates, we use them to predict our uh, accuracy value for our classifier. So the key step, of course, of this method is step number two. You know, how do we train this model? You know, well, the idea is that we re we can represent the 
data points as extended paths, okay? I'll call them X double dot and Y double dot, okay? So what is the vector X double dot? It's a vector that contains all of the original covariates, all of the original features, you know, which our classifier H uses, and also contains the posterior probabilities, the confidence values that the classifier has returned for this uh, item, you know. So, you know, what is Y double dot, the label? The label this time represents the contingency table cell where this item has ended up, you know. So it's a label that ranges not on the original set of classes Y, but on our contingency table, you know. So the story is different for labeled data and unlabeled data. For the data points in, the, in our validation set, which are labeled, Y double dot encodes a pair. The pair that contains the true class of X, we know it because the validation data are labeled, and the class that H has predicted for it, because we can apply our classifier H to this item and predict a class from it. Okay. So for data points in the unlabeled set, this is different. You know, why double dot is unknown? Because we know, we can know the class which is attributed to the item by the classifier, but we don't know the true class. So why double dot has to be estimated. Observation number two. The observation number two is that in order to estimate the values, the counts of uh, the contingency table cells, we don't strictly need to predict the cell where each individual data point will end. We only need to predict the counts, you know, predict the counts or the frequencies, the, the proportions, the proportions of data points that will end in each cell. This observation leads to an idea. Instead of using uh, classification, you know, which essentially uh, would tell me the cell where each data point will end, you know, we want to use quantification, quantification methods to estimate these frequencies. What are quantification methods? Quantification is a task which is somehow intermediate between, uh, between classification and regression, you know, and it's the task of training uh, predictors of the fractions of data points that belong to each class. Predictions of the relative frequencies of data points, predictions of the prevalence values, you may call them whatever you want, you know. Predictions of the fractions of data points that belong to each class. And one interesting aspect of um, quantification methods is that they tend to train quantifiers which are robust to data set shift by design. Because uh, let's say data set shift is the main concern which is at the heart of quantification research. The very first paper you know, of the quantification literature was a paper that tested its uh, system under prior probability shift. So in a sense, data set shift is you know, at the heart of quantification research. You know? uh, well, what is the goal of quantification methods? The goal of the quantification literature is to improve the accuracy in predicting class frequencies over the simplistic technique of classifying count. You know, classifying count is essentially apply a classifier to all of the individual items and count how many items have you have given, you have attributed to each class. And to improve over this simplistic method by deploying special purpose machine learning techniques. So machine learning techniques, which are specifically oriented to doing, to predicting frequencies rather than assigning labels to individual items. So up to now, you know, I've given you a very general picture of, of Quack. Uh, essentially uh, in this talk, I will focus, and in the experiments I'm going to present, we have focused on a specific setting. So the specific setting is predicting the accuracy of binary classifiers. So we leave multi-class classifiers aside for the moment, and also focusing on prior probability shift. So leaving covariate shift and concept shift uh, aside for, for the moment. Um, so essentially during the course of this research, we have developed uh, three different variants 
of the quark uh, method. So the main variant is what we call the one by four method. And it's essentially what I have described up to now. So it's a method which is based on training on our labeled validation data, a single quantifier, a multi-class quantifier because it deals with four classes, a quantifier that estimates the frequencies of the four classes, TP, FN, FP, TM, the four cells of the binary contingency table. Okay, so, you know, for the one by four method, the basic process is essentially the one I've described up to now. So first of all, we classify the instances of the validation set, the label instance of the validation set using our train classifier H. So that we can obtain our extended representations X double dot, Y double dot. Okay, so for these instances, we have not only the original features, X, I, uh, not only the true uh, class, Y, I, but we also have the predicted class, you know, and we have all of the posterior probabilities that the classifier has returned, you know. So we also can classify the instances of U, the unlabeled, uh, the unlabeled set using our classifier to obtain uh, extended representations for which we have only X double dot, because we don't have Y double dot for the simple fact that for the unlabeled data, we don't know the true class. At this point, we can uh, train on V double dot on the extended representations for the validation data. We can train a quantifier, a multi-class quantifier that allows us to obtain, you know, estimates of these of the counts of these four classes, estimates of the fractions of unlabeled items that have ended up in the TP cell, estimates of the fractions that have been ended up in the FN cells, et cetera. Okay. So of course, I mean, this, this method, which is called the one by four, admits of a multi-class version, you know, an evident multi-class version, which is the called the one by uh, one by n square uh, method for the fact that, you know, in the multi-class version, we are going to have a contingency table mm -hmm. which has n square cells. So we have to train one single multi-class quantifier that, that deals with n square classes. Um, second observation, the second observation which underlies our second quark variant, which we call the two by two method. The observation is, is that, for instance, we know the set TP union FN. P, the union of the true positives and the false negatives is essentially the set of items which have been assigned the positive class by the classifier. So it's the predicted positives. And we know the predicted positives. And we know the predicted negatives, TN, UFP. So in a sense, we can essentially factorize our method, we can generate a method which instead of training one single quantifier, which has to deal with four classes, we train two quantifiers, which deal with two classes each. So one that discriminates between the classes TP and FN, and one that discriminates between the classes TN and FP. This idea sounds really advantageous, you know, over the one by four method for two main reasons. Okay? First of all, it exploits additional knowledge. Our knowledge of the sets TPU, TP uh, union FN and TN union FP. And also the second reason is that it implements a sort of a divided impera principle. So it basically subdivides a complex problem, okay, quantifying on four classes in two more, in two simpler problems. So quantifying uh, between two classes each. Again, this method admits, admits of an obvious multi-class version, which we call the end by end method, since it has to do with the essentially generating n quantifiers, each task with deciding, with, with estimating the class prevalence values of n classes each. There is a third variant, which uh, starts from another observation. And it is the observations that the false positives and the false negatives 
tend to lie in two regions which are contiguous. Okay, so take the false positives. False positives essentially lie in the region that the classifier has assigned to the uh, to the positives. Okay, but they probably lie just just uh, off the separating surface. Okay, so in a region which is close to the separating surface. Again, this is the same for the false negatives. False negatives lie in the, in the region that the classifier has assigned to the negatives, but the line, they most of them lie just you know, off the separating surface. So these two regions, you know, the region of the false positives and the false negatives, they are in a sense contiguous. So in a sense, we might try to view them as a single region, the region of FP union Fn. So this is the idea on which the one by three method is based. Okay, so here, in the one by three method, we train on our validation data, a single quantifier that has to do with three classes, okay, discriminating between TP, TN, and the union of FP, UN. Okay. So does this work? Well, there's a caveat here, okay. So this one by three method can be used only for classifier accuracy measures that do not differentiate between false positives and false negatives. You know, luckily it can be used to say for vanilla accuracy because in vanilla accuracy, you can, if you know the, uh, let's say how many uh, mistakes you've done. Okay. So if you know the cardinality of P UFN, it's, it's enough for you to compute vanilla accuracy. And the same for F1. But of course, I mean, it's not enough if your uh, classifier accuracy measure is, say, cost sensitive. In cost sensitive classifier accuracy measure, typically, you know, you, you impose a different cost for a false positive and, and a different cost for a false negative. So you cannot confuse false positives and false negatives. The, the two previous methods, instead, two by two and one by four, you know, can be used for all classifier accuracy measure. Uh, so independently of which of the three variants you can use, something you might want to do is to add new covariates. You know, add the new covariates to extend the representation that, in a sense, uh, make explicit some information which is already implicitly present in the vector. And in with, indeed, you know, we add some covariates that have to do with the let's say, with the level of confidence with which the classifier has taken its decision. So for instance, max conf is one additional covariate. It's the maximum of the posterior probabilities for uh, item X. Okay, so when this is very high, it means that, you know, the classifier has taken that decision with high confidence, you know, and vice versa. Negative entropy is, is again a different way of, uh, uh, you know, estimating the confidence with which the classifier has taken a certain decision. Okay. So for instance, when entropy is maximum, it means that confidence is, is minimum. Now, when entropy is minimum, which means say one of the posteriors is one and all of the others are zero, then the confidence is maximum. And max inverse of max is a similar concept. So we, we add these additional covariates to the extended representations. Now, let me show you a few experiments, okay, which uh, we have um, used in order to assess this, this method. This also gives me an opportunity to look at the type of experimentation that one needs to do when testing systems for classifier accuracy prediction. And here, we the experiments we have done are aimed at simulating prior probability shift. And they do it by using the so-called artificial prevalence protocol. The artificial prevalence protocol is a method to extract from a data, given data set omega, a number of uh, scenarios you know, to which you can submit your system. Okay? So it's sort of meant to be a sort of a stress test for robustness to prior probability shift because it simulates a very wide amount of different scenarios, a wide variety of amounts of 
training data imbalance, of test data imbalance, and a wide variety of amounts of prior probability shift. So the idea is that the artificial prevalence protocol is a way of extracting from a data set omega a number of training samples, a number of validation samples, a number of test samples, which are characterized by predefined class frequencies. So class frequencies lying on a pre-specified grid. So for instance, you might want to extract uh, you know, a training sample that has only 10% of positives, you know, and uh, uh, ask it to classify a, a test sample which has 90% of positives. So it means that you have generated a situation with very high prior probability shift. So by doing by experimenting on entire range of values of this grid, you generate many different situations in which you know you you test your system. So in a sense, this experimentation is an a robust experimentation, a stress test for robustness to prior probability shift. Kind of experiments that we run use the two different uh, quantification methods. Uh, SLD and KDE. You know, these are, uh, I will not enter the details of these systems. Uh, it suffices to know that SLD and KDE are the state of the art uh, systems uh, for multi class quantification method once uh, it has to address prior probability shift. So it is important that these quantification methods are multi class because, uh, you know, two of our three variants, you know, the one by three and one by four, deal with more than two classes, three classes or four classes. So we cannot just have binary quantification methods. So this is sort of a table that summarizes a bit our experimental setup. We use the four very large uh, textual data sets, IMDB, which is, uh, let's say, movie reviews, uh, CCAT, GCAT, MCAT, which are essentially news from the Reuters Corpus Volume 1. So it's essentially it's a newswire reports. Classifier, we use the logistic regression because logistic regression tends to work uh, very well with the text. It's also computationally efficient, so it allowed us to run a large number of experiments. And for quantifiers, we use the SLD and KDE. As I said, you know, they are two, the two state-of-the-art methods. And we also use the, the trivial classify and count. And the reason why we test the classify and count will be apparent in a while. Uh, concerning the training data, validation data, and uh, unlabeled data, essentially you extract samples according to the artificial prevalence protocol. So, you know, training data, which are needed for training the classifier H, you know, we select uh, training samples, uh, which we extract according to a grid of class frequencies from 0.10 to 0.90, you know. And uh, validation, the validation data, validation samples are needed for training our quantifier. And the validation samples, again, we extracted according to the same nine point grid class frequencies. So every time there is a training sample, we pair it with the validation sample of the same frequency in order to represent the fact that uh, T and V come from the same uh, data distribution. You know. Concerning the unlabeled uh, data, we extract the game test samples according to a larger grid, you know, 21 point grid. This includes also uh, zero prevalence, zero frequency or, you know, 1.0 frequency because this are potentially, can potentially happen in test data, you know? And here for each of these uh, fre class frequency values on the grid, we take 100 uh, random samples per frequency of 1,000 uh, data points each. Um, I will uh, uh, also mention what the baseline systems were uh, we used. Essentially we used, uh, we tried to use all of the classifier actually prediction methods which have been published in the last five years that make their code available. So as you know, not to have to reimplement everything, possibly making mistakes. You know? In terms of classifier accuracy measure, we use two different ones. This is something novel in the literature because all of the published methods only use vanilla accuracy. We here use two, you know, but we could have used many more. You know? 
And uh, uh, in terms of the classifier accuracy prediction error measure, we use simply the absolute difference between the predicted accuracy and the true uh, accuracy. So I will uh, sort of skip uh, the optimization part. You know, it's uh, it's the kind of hyperparameter optimization part that you imagine. It's only important to say one thing. Okay, so we individually optimized all three variants of our method: one, one by four, two by two, one by three. Because in preliminary experiments we had found out that each of them has its own merits. There is none of them which is clearly superior to the other two. So we decided to train the three of them, all of them, and you know, uh, put the model selection in charge of choosing the best one according to the given the given situation. So let me present a few experimental results. Here you are seeing the uh, results for vanilla accuracy as our classifier uh, accuracy measure. On the lines, you have all of the different methods where the baselines are on top and the our quack variants are at the bottom. And the last row, uh, well, you know, in this table, essentially boldface as usual represents the best result. You know? And you can what you can notice is that the best results is always obtained by one of our variant, by a quack uh, variant. Sometimes um, instantiated with the SLD quantifier, sometimes instantiated with the KDE quantifier. You know? The uh, next uh, table is the same. The difference is that uh, uh, F1 is the classifier accuracy measure. And uh, instead of uh, vanilla accuracy, which was the case in the previous uh, table. Something to notice. OK, so uh, quack is always the winning method. It's always in boldface, as you can see. Uh, what we can notice is that um, it's not always the same variant. Okay? So sometimes the KDE variant is the best. Sometimes the SLD is the best. It has to be noticed that also the baselines. Okay? So it's not always the case that the best baseline is the same. You know, sometimes it's the DOC method. Sometimes it's the ATC uh, method, while the other ones never come out on, on top. And just for your reference, the baseline, which is here called naive, is, you know, what we might do naively, you know, for estimating classifier accuracy on, on auto-distribution data. Essentially, we test our classifier on our validation set, you know, which is, you know, still coming from the same distribution. And we assume that the same accuracy that we have uh, obtained will also uh, be the case on out of distribution data. You know, a naive uh, assumption, you know, but we actually test the, the effect of this naive assumption, you know. Uh, so something else that we should uh, note, uh, you know, is something interesting, okay? So we have, uh, uh, we also instantiated quack with uh, classify and count, with the naive, uh, the, the most naive of quantifiers, okay? Uh, the result is sort of interesting because in four combinations out of eight, you know, we have four combinations, four data sets by two uh, classifier accuracy measures. In four combinations out of eight, um, even uh, quack instantiated with CC outperforms the best baseline. Okay, so this is an indication. It's an indication that uh, actually viewing the cells of the contingency table as classes is a good idea. You know, the very fact that uh, you know the quack instantiated with genuine quantifiers SLD and KDE always outperforms both Quack CC and the baselines is instead an indication that, you know, using quantification methods which are robust to prior probability shift is also a good idea, you know. So in a sense, the success of Quack SLD and Quack KDE is the result of two interesting observations, two interesting ideas viewing the contingency table cells as classes, 
and using uh, quantification methods, which are known to be robust to prior probability shift in order to estimate their uh, frequencies. Something which should be also observed is that the, the error reduction levels are quite hefty. Okay, error reduction, the last row, indicates the improvement of the best quack variant with respect to the best baseline. So you might notice that these improvements are quite hefty, ranging from 5% to 31% in the case of vanilla accuracy, but they are even much bigger for F1. They range between 67% to 75% in the case of F1. And this is also an indication that Quack is fairly robust to, uh, let's say, difficult measures such as F1. F1 is a difficult measure because it's uh, discontinuous in many cases. You know, it has a number of formal properties that are not terribly good. You know? uh, so F1 is understandably a measure which is difficult to deal with. You know? And Quack, uh, you might notice that the results of Quack are better for vanilla accuracy than for F1, but the results of the baselines are much better for vanilla accuracy than for F1. So for, for F1, some of the baselines really perform disastrously. Let's say that Quack is still fairly robust to F1 too. You know. Something that I want to note is that, is that each figure in this cell is the average value of the error measure, the classifier actually classifier accuracy prediction uh, error measure across something like eighteen thousand, more than eighteen thousand cases, okay, which result from nine different values on the training grid, twenty-one different values on the testing grid, and one hundred uh, testing samples for each of the twenty-one cases. You know. So uh, graphically, you know, this uh, this is an example of uh, let's say the prediction error, you know, when vanilla accuracy is our classifier accuracy uh, measure um, on the IMDb uh, dataset. IMDb is a, is a dataset on which uh, we have uh, good improvements with respect to the baselines, not the best improvements. So it's an average for us. It's an average result. So it's the one where we have the lowest improvements for, for F1. Still, you know, uh, you can see the difference between the baselines and our methods. Our methods, which are green and yellow, you know, the error tends to be pretty stable independently of the amount of prior probability shift which is indicated on the x-axis, you know. Instead of the baselines, especially ATC, this error increases a lot when prior probability shift uh, increases. So this is a different plot. So this is, uh, this is F1, it's not vanilla accuracy, it's still IMDB. And instead the plot is uh, error, classifier accuracy prediction error as a function of test prevalence. Okay, so the, let's say, the, the proportion of positives and negatives in the test data. Again, you can see that the baselines, blue and red, are much higher than uh, yellow and green, which are our, our two variants. It's quite interesting to see uh, diagonal plots, you know. A diagonal plot is a plot where each, uh, say, blue dot is an experiment in which uh, the, let's say, the system should have predicted a certain level of accuracy, which is on the x-axis, and instead predicted, estimated a different level of accuracy, which is on the y-axis. And because of this, you can notice that the perfect prediction system would have all of its dots on the diagonal. You know, the fact that uh, here we are seeing the naive system, the naive system is really naive, okay, because it keeps predicting the, uh, it predicts uh, the, the accuracy that it recorded on the validation data for all samples in the unlabeled data. So it's, it naively assumes that whatever sample you get in the unlabeled data, you will obtain 
the performance that has been recorded on the validation data. The validation data is recorded quite high accuracy, around 90%, and it keeps predicting 90%, even if it should have predicted 20% or 40% or 60%. So it's truly a naive uh, system. So here is RCA, it's one of our baseline. It's not as naive as the naive system, but it's still, you know, it's far from having its uh, all of its points uh, close to the diagonal. Here it's uh, a much better baseline, ATC, you know. You can see that, uh, you know, all of the points uh, tend to be closer to the diagonal, you know, although ATC tends to be fairly optimistic. It often tends to predict a, an accuracy level which is higher than it should have predicted. DOC, another baseline, even better, you know. So here we are seeing a system which tends to approach, you know, the diagonal much more. Our systems are represented like this. This is quack instantiated with classifying count, the naive system, you know. Still, it delivers reasonably good accuracy, even if no true quantification system is involved. Let's see what the accuracy with involved in quantification systems is. So this is Quark instantiated with the SLD, one of the two state-of-the-art quantification systems that we have seen. You clearly see that the performance is the best of the ones we have seen up to now. This is Quark uh, instantiated with KDE. So it's uh, yet another uh, state-of-the-art quantification system, still very good. Sometimes it has uh, some outliers, you know, and we haven't yet figured out figure out why, you know, we are sort of trying to study why the reason of these outliers. So this, this sort of ends my lecture, you know. So what are the lessons learned? Lessons learned about quack, lessons learned about classifier accuracy, accuracy prediction. Let me discuss quack a bit. So we have seen that it outperforms the baselines, that it's robust to difficult accuracy measures, such as that one. Um, and we have seen that even the simplistic quack gives good results. So in other words, we have seen that the success of quack comes from two reasons, viewing continuously stable cells as classes and using PPS robust quantification algorithms for predicting the values of these cells. So what can we see about, what can we say about CAP, classifier accuracy prediction? Classifier accuracy prediction under PPS, we have shown that can be performed reasonably well. It's good news. So in our tables, we witnessed average classifier accuracy prediction errors, which are smaller than 2% for vanilla accuracy smaller than 3% for F1. So 2% means essentially, you know, the true accuracy that I should have, should have predicted is 42%, but I predicted 40% or 44%, you know, reasonably good if we consider that in that protocol, we have subjected our systems with radically large, you know, amounts of prior probability shift. There are still margins of improvement, you know. I I also had the slides with the future work that we want to carry out, but I'll skip the slides in the interest of questions. So I'll leave the floor to questions if there are any. And I thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you very much, Fabrizio, for your very interesting talk. Uh, are there questions, please? If there are questions, do raise your voice rather than write in, uh, in chat. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Please speak louder. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, great. So, um, thanks. First of all, thank you for this interesting talk. Uh, I learned a lot. So uh, I have one first question, which is uh, um, I saw that actually the validation set and the unlabeled test set are actually not from the same distribution. So do you have any insight why the quantification method still can 
train a robust quantifier for this prediction task? Or if that works, can we actually use that technique to train a robust classifier instead, rather than um, using an additional quantization method to predict its performance? So this is my first question. It's a very good question. Uh, so as you said, uh, you know, the validation set and the unlabeled set come from two different distributions. Okay, and so you were wondering how come given these different distributions, we can still train good uh, quantifiers, good quality quantifiers. Yes. So I would say that the reason is that, uh, you know, quantification as a discipline, as a task was born with uh, data set shift in mind, with prior probability shift in mind, okay? So the techniques which are now state of the art are techniques that can bridge this gap, the gap between these two distributions, okay? So uh, in, in a sense, so for instance, take uh, SLD. SLD is, uh, is a method, it's, it's a fairly old method, okay? It's been in existence for 20 years or more. You know, it's a method that uh, tries to, uh, let's say, update the posterior probabilities, you know, returned by the classifier by detecting a mismatch between the sum of the posterior probabilities and the estimated priors. So it um, uses expectation maximization in order to iteratively refine both, you know, both the posterior probabilities and the uh, class prevalence values until the two become mutually consistent, okay? So it's one of the many techniques which have been used, you know, to estimate class frequencies in the presence of prior probability shift. So the second part of your question is, uh, given that we are so good, you know, at um, bridging, you know, the difference between the two distributions for quantification. Can we do it for classification too? Well, yes, you know, this is the task of domain adaptation, you know, and indeed, uh, this technique that I mentioned, SLD, uh, you know, was detected with domain adaptation in mind. So the idea was, uh, you know, to estimate the class uh, frequencies in order to be able to adapt the posterior probabilities to the new reality, okay? So in order to adapt the classifier to change conditions. You know? So in, um, a lot of the literature in quantification was born out of the desire to adapt a classifier trained on a certain distribution to data on another distribution. So I hope this uh, answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a uh, I have multiple questions for that. So my second question is, what's the link between clock and uh, the? There are also many works on model calibration, which trying to calibrate the model conference to match the accuracy. Is there any uh, link between the two? A link between calibration and and the clock. Um, and quack. Okay, so what is the relationship between? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, calibration plays a very important role in, um, in quantification. And so it plays a very important role in quack because quack is heavily based on, on quantification. So just to give you an idea, the SLD method that I discussed, you know, it's, it's a state-of-the-art quantification method. You know, it's, uh, it's a method that tries to um, update, you know, posterior probabilities. So, okay. So, okay, so the idea is that it, it assumes, you know, that the original posterior probabilities are calibrated, but posterior probabilities cannot be, if they are calibrated on a certain distribution, they cannot be calibrated at the same time for a different distribution, you know? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you might take SLD, which is a quantification method, a domain adaptation method, as we, you might call it, you might take it as a means to uh, recalibrate the uh, 
uh, recalibrate the posterior probabilities for out of distribution data. Okay, so to generate posterior probabilities, you know, on out of distribution data that, um, you know, look, uh, are more calibrated than, than before, you know. Although, I... you know, although they, they the, let's say, the, the task of doing uh, calibration for out of distribution data is still, you know, an, uh, an open problem, you know, and the SLD makes one step towards it. I see. Uh, my third question is about uh, more about- the uh, Excuse me for a moment. Let's check if there are other questions by others. Okay. Okay, please go ahead for your third question. Oh, my third question is, uh, so I noticed that in the experimental result part, uh, you use multiple different combinations of uh, case from validation and test set. Uh, it's kind of like a very huge like amount of computation, computing. So I wonder to deploy Quark, is, uh, do we need to still follow in the same regime? Um, maybe I have not entirely understood your question. L let me try to rephrase. Yeah. You said, uh, I think you said, I have noticed that in order to uh, to to run Quark, you need to do quite a lot of hyperparameter validation. So uh, not about the hyperparameter. It's more about the uh, result part. Can you go back to the result slide? Okay, let me go back to the results. Uh, just a moment. Uh, okay. Yeah, here. So there is a note uh, in the bottom of this slide. You see yes. that uh, you needed to have like more than eighteen um, k combinations yes. of uh, training sample and test sample. So I wonder. Yes whether a particle will also need to get run multiple combinations to get a reliable number, or this is just for the evaluation of uh, the quark and the different settings? Uh, essentially, this very high number is for evaluation purposes. Okay, So mm -hmm. you, in order to get, uh, let's say, experimental results, which are you know statistically robust, you want to see, you want to run many different combinations okay and so many different combinations is means that we took uh, say nine uh, as i let, let me uh, go back to okay here um, so for training the system okay so essentially we don't have a single training set we have a sort of a pool of data from which we extract training sets but um, say one time we extract a training set that has only 10% of positives. Another time we extract a training set which has 20% of positives. Okay, 30% of positives, 90% of positives. So we use a nine point grid of class frequencies. So for testing, okay, again, we work on a grid. We extract a sample which has say 0% positive or 0.10 percent positive, 0.20, etc. So you might, uh, there are cases in which you confront, uh, let's say, you use a training, uh, uh, a training set which has 10% positives and a test sample which has 10% positives. In this case, you have no PPS, but you have a case in which you have 10% positives and in, in the 10% training positives, and 90% test positives. So you have an enormous amount of prior probability shift. So in a sense, we generate many different scenarios. Okay, so as, as I said here, you know, each cell, you know, is the result of testing 18,900 different scenarios characterized by different values of uh, training, uh, training proportions, testing proportions, and prior probability shift values. Okay, so you, at the same time, you test the situations characterized by training set imbalance, by test set imbalance, and by prior probability shift. 
So it's hard to you know, so devise an experimentation which is more robust than this. I see. That's very impressive. I have one last question, but I saw people also posted uh, in the in the chat. Uh, so I, maybe I will save my question. Uh, the other. Yes. May I request you send to Professor uh, Sebastian an email with your question. Typically, you know, a person here has one or two questions, but no, not really four in each lecture. Um, but Bridget, I have a question regarding the, the use of your work in the following context. Uh, let's suppose that... Um, the use of my what? Of your work in, in um, teacher-student uh, DNN framework. So... Let's suppose that we have a number of DNNs that are, that have been trained uh, for, for a certain task on different types of data. Then um, uh, you get a test data set. Uh, you check your own DNN, whether it performs well or whether it has good accuracy. If it does not have good accuracy, it is already problem number one, how to, to assess this. Uh, then you send this test data sets to the various teachers and you choose the one that has best performance. Uh, we have addressed this issue by using out of distribution detectors, um, which is a slightly different uh, methodology. Uh, do you think that your technique can be used in such a setting to choose the best teacher? I would have to think about it. <laughs> maybe it's, uh, you are we have worked that. in this domain, so maybe this could be a possibility for cooperation, also the framework of yes, the AI yes, for media yes. project. Yes, yes, I agree. We we should, uh, uh, well, it, uh, the question catches me a bit off guard, you know, and yeah. uh, I should uh, maybe think about it and maybe we should <laughs> talk about it offline because it's uh... yeah sure sure it yes. could be a good application of your work yes. because we, yes. we solved such problems in an indirect way not in a direct way yes 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 but this there can be an, an alternative to this is there any other question if there are no other questions then i would like to thank can, uh... I, can I answer the fourth question by Chen Chen, because I, I saw it in the chat and I noticed it's an interesting okay, question. Okay, please go ahead. So the, the question uh, is... <laughs> Thank you. I want to talk is, to uh, Yes. I saw that the question is, can quark be applied to predicting the errors of a regression problem? Okay, so the, the question, I guess, is, can quark be applied to predicting the accuracy of a regressor instead of a quantifier. I had never really thought about it, but what I can say is that um, what comes to mind is the fact that, uh, um, you know, in quantification, so there is something called regression quantification. It's something that stands to regression as standard quantification stands to classification. Okay, so maybe, uh, I don't know, by uh, looking at techniques of regression quantification, one might uh, try to predict the accuracy of regressors on out of distribution data. But this is very much a maybe because I had never really, you know, asked myself this question. And thank you for for asking this. Yeah, because I feel like there is uh, not so much work on the regression problem, but it can be very important uh, because I'm working in healthcare. So sometimes the task is about the regression, and uh, you, you you work in in what? Uh, I work on healthcare application. Healthcare, yes. Yeah, I also working on some other of domain prediction, etc. But I, I saw that currently there is not too much work on the regression task because where the output is less bounded compared to uh, the classification. Yes, task. yes, yes. That that's very interesting. Let, let's uh, talk about it further, maybe offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's uh, you posed an interesting question, and it might be an interesting resource problem, which might have solutions. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any last question, please? 
Then I would like to thank you very much, Professor uh, Sebastiani, for his very interesting talk. And I would like to thank all of you for participating. Uh, please keep tuned for future um, IDA AIX lectures. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Maybe it's time now to start. Great.